examples. <laughs> um, the point count test that Rick Decker, like here by Harrison Ford, uh, and the other LAPD Blade Runners administer two potential replicants in Ridley, uh, I'm sorry, in Philip K. Dick's 1968 novel, To Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, and um, Ridley Scott's 1982 film, Blade Runner, um, is a version of the Turing test. It involves, it relies on physiological and emotional response, not written language, but both depend on dialogue, on interactions, and on story to provoke the necessary responses for the evaluator to make a decision. Um, the consequences are a little bit more extreme in this particular Turing test, but usually it's just, yes, you are, no, you're not. Not, um, you get destroyed as a replicant. So <laughs> that's a good thing. Um, Popular culture is full of characters who walk right up to the edge of humanity but can't seem to get there. Um, from HAL 9000 and Space Odyssey 2001 to Commander Data and Star Trek. So it's, there's been this ongoing sort of play of what is or isn't a human? Do humans want to be robots? Do robots want to be humans? And what is that? What does that mean? Um, and outside of the world of fiction, touring test competitions have been a thing for a good two decades now. And it really freaked people out in 2014 when a robot finally passed the Turing test, or more accurately, a robot passed a version of the Turing test. And it was a Russian-designed chatbot named Eugene in a competition at the University of Brady, Brady in the UK. And it's interesting because uh, with Turing's test, you're, you're wondering about, is it a human, is it a robot, is it a man, is it a woman? So, so gender is in question, humanity is in question. And here, um, what's interesting about Eugene is he's a very specific chatbot. Um, he's, he's a boy, he's Russian, he's 13, um, he's typing in English, which is his second language, and so that, that projects a whole bunch of things to the judges, so I almost wonder if it wasn't the story around Eugene rather than whatever the bot actually said that makes him human, but that's kind of for the Q&A. And also kind of a side note, I, just, I talked a little bit about this, um, talked to about four different people, and I, I gave a short summary, okay, I'm gonna talk about this thing. Oh wow, you're gonna talk about this! Four different people went four completely different directions with what I said I was going to do. So I suspect the same will happen here. So I'm going to go one direction, and I would love to know where the rest of you will go during the Q&A. Please, that'd be awesome. So as far as Eugene and the Turing test, the version of that he passed, I'd venture to say that a lot of bots have passed informal versions of that Turing test and with pretty concrete um, consequences in the years since with disturbing results, for example, in the 2016, in the lead up to the 2016 presidential election, if you don't know who you're talking to, it can really shape your sort of notion of reality even though you're not talking to a human. And as for the second part of my title, so I didn't think I'd actually be dropping F-bombs or even asterisk F-bombs because there are children around here somewhere, I think, um, as part of an academic talk, but here we are anyway. So most of you probably know about this one too, but the theory I referenced in the title is from webcomic Penny Arcade which is written by Jerry Holkins and Mike, and illustrated by Mike Krahulik. Um, in more polite company, it's called the Online Disinhibition Effect. And they've been doing comics like this about three times a week since 1998, and this came out in 2004. Um, John Gabriel is one of the protagonists of this ongoing um, sort of series of stories in Penny Arcade. Um, it's the alter ego of um, Krahulik. And it's set up like a, a math equation. You have a normal person, you have anonymity, you have an audience, and you have a dual interface, or F1. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's, um, let's see. So Clay Shirky is a journalist and academic who works on the social and economic impact of internet technologies and journalism. And he offers interesting, they, he was interviewed about this in The Advocate and, was, and, and reminded the interviewer and as such the audience that it's not just anonymity, it's the lack of consequences that come with the anonymity. No one knows who you are, so they can't punish you. You can't see the person, so you can't see um, their face respond and hurt. They can't yell back at you, they can't punch you. So um, not everyone succumbs to this particular effect, but it's, it's an explanation of why people seem so much angrier and, and aggressive online or can be. Um, and let's see. So this brings me to the part that I've been circling for the last few weeks or months now. These two situations are just about identical. You have, um, you're sitting at a computer and communicating via SMS or chat or some technological written medium. 
with someone or something, you, or electronic written medium with someone or something you cannot see. And in one of those situations, a robot may well be trying to convince its audience that it is human. In the other, a human enthralled to the online disinhibition effect, dis inhibition effect or the GIFT, as it's um, abbreviated, um, is communicating with you as if neither of you were human, as if they had lost all sense of humanity and as if they could not see or recognize you as a human or, or feel any empathy toward the person on the other end of that computer screen or on the other end of that, I would say, um, either phone line or, or internet connection. So what does it mean when the medium used to test humanity is also the one that seems to encourage otherwise normal humans to be least human or at least least humane to each other? Because I sort of realized assuming human equals humane is, is kind of an optimistic definition of human, but that's, um, I'll stick with that one for now. Um, so if we count these exchanges as, as a form of everyday storytelling, the sort of interactive storytelling uh, or conversation that takes place, and it's in conversations ranging from small talk about the weather to existential discussions of life, the universe, and everything, it's, it's the whole continuum. Uh, what is it about this particular medium that seems to bring out the most human in robots, sometimes, and the least human in the humans? I don't know exactly. I don't have the answer, but I have a few answers. And um, so, or at least the beginning of one of those answers comes in two parts. So looking at the materiality of the writing of the medium, what the message is carried, what which message is carried by this particular medium, and by the interactions and interrelations between humans and technology, or humans and robots. Let's see. So, oh, yes. Okay. Um, I heard what you're saying. You know nothing of my work. You mean my whole fallacy is wrong? How you ever got to teach a course in anything is totally amazing. Marshall McLuhan. Um, I, this is from Annie Hall, 1997, I'm sorry, 1977, Woody Allen, where um, a guy sort of pontificating on Marshall McLuhan, I teach media studies at NYU, and Marshall McLuhan himself comes out from behind a poster and says, you know nothing of my work. I'm like, I'm kind of, he's been dead since 1980, but I would love it if he'd do that right now, but probably not. So this is McLuhan. Um, and his, he wrote, he's a Canadian um, philosopher and media theorist who published the understand, understanding the immediate extensions of man, which is a fright, ridiculously frighteningly appreciated exploration of media, technology, and culture. Um, so for McLuhan, that the message of any medium or technology is the change of scale or pace or pattern that it introduces into human affairs. So if you're looking from highways to airways, from snail mail, or sorry, postal mail, to <laughs> email, from carrier pigeon to phone call, all of those things um, impact scale, pace, and pattern. And so when he says, what he means when he says the medium is the message is that, I'm gonna quote McLuhan himself, it is the medium that shapes and controls the scale and form of human association and interaction, end quote. And as the medium changes, so do the scale and the form, basically the entire nature of human interaction and association. And McLuhan sees all forms of technology as extensions of the human. And this can become kind of a problem since, according to McLuhan, um, all of these extensions of ourselves involve us in a state of numbness in an attempt to reach equilibrium. The world is an uncomfortable place. It's loud, it's overwhelming. There's more visual stimuli that we can deal with. And so that's sort of what we do to cope. And these extensions don't just leave us numb. Um, he, pr he poses that there's, um, that, well, lost my place. Um, the idea is, um, he, thinks, he proposes that it's also, it's, there's numbness because we use these, we use technologies as extensions, as prosthetics, and that involves a level of self amputation And that goes back to, um, we withdraw from the world, and it's the way the central nervous system protects itself, and it's pretty extreme in doing so. Just whatever threatens its function, whatever threatens its equilibrium, must be contained, localized, or cut off, even to the total removal of the offending organ." End quote. And this, um, so we have this amputation or isolation, which leads to numbness, and that really alarms McLuhan. For someone who wrote so much about technology, he was actually kind of a technophobe. He was pretty freaked out because he knew what technology could give and take away, and the transformative power on the human, human existence. Um, because for McLuhan, this, this numbness, this self-amputation, with that self-amputation comes a lack of self 
recognition. And so to take that formulation a step further, if we can't recognize ourselves anymore, we can't recognize ourselves in others either, which converts them into completely foreign others, which kind of explains the online disinhibition effect. And it's interesting um, that would explain why a troll or an avoid would not see another person as a full person. They can't. Um, this is, it's not a universal effect, but one who is operating under this effect can't even see themselves as human. So um, when confronted with, them, with this behavior, most of these trolls or avoids or what have you will often ex insist um, that's not really me, it's a persona, I'm a good person, they really can't associate what they've done typing with what they would do face to face. And it's come up over and over again. This lack of self-recognition suggests another possibility, despite all of the attention paid to the question of whether or not a computer can pass a Turing test, what happens when a human fails it? Um, this has been explored to humorous effect as well, one of my favorite versions being from Piled Higher and Deeper is a webcomic from um, Hokkaidam. This came out in 2014. Um, what happens is I sent an email to our professor and I get a cryptic reply. Do it. <laughs> 